Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Monday and I'm continuing my reading of Emma. I've just about finished the first volume and if, I'm, <laughs> if I do well and read a lot tonight, hopefully I'll finish about half of the second volume for you guys tomorrow. I have my notebook in my lap and it's, my pages are wrestling. But I wanted to start off with a discussion about their collection of riddles. Now this again sort of shows the dominance of Emma in the relationship between herself and Harriet because Harriet is obviously inspired to create a collection of riddles based on what some of the teachers do at the school where she's gone to school. Uh, but it's also something that Emma's very good at and that Harriet is not that great at. So it really shows Emma's prowess and power and intelligence and superiority to Harriet over and over again. Functionally in the story, they serve another role. They serve to highlight Emma's essential blindness that no matter how intelligent Emma is, no matter how clear seeing she can be with regard to the riddles, she still continues to be blind as far as peering into the hearts and minds of the people around her. We also get in this chapter, I think it's chapter nine, Emma visiting the family, the poor family in the neighborhood who has a family member who's sick. And, you know, I, this really does improve my opinion of Emma as we get to see her in, the, in this context. And Emma has good intentions and they go far, but they only go so far. Much like her intention to keep her reading lists and follow through on them, much like her intention to you know, significantly improve Harriet's understanding also through reading lists, never following through on them, much like her inability to really follow through and practice her art. She also doesn't follow through on her intention to sort of keep her mind humble and keep the uh, experience of the charitable visit that she did sort of forefront at her mind. She thinks that she intends to, she wants to do that, but as soon as Mr. Elton comes into the scene, then her mind is carried away by her own interests. And frankly, I think that's what a lot of us are like. We all have a lot of really good intentions, myself included, about the goals that I want to set for myself, and it's hard for us to keep to them, especially when they have to do with maybe our character and our character development. It's hard to force character development. We also get a bit more about Frank Churchill and his adoption. And again, we have this connection to, I think, Jane Austen's older brother. We talked about it in the brief biography that I did towards the beginning of the month, that one of Emma's brothers was adopted by a wealthy family and sort of raised up in consequence compared to everybody else, all of her other siblings and everybody else in her family. And this is a theme also in Mansfield. And I don't know how, if something that extraordinary happened in your family circle, that that wouldn't be something that you would meditate upon in your literature. I mean, it's just like a fairy tale. It's just ripe for a storytelling. And whether that be the main character, as in the case with Fanny Price, whether it be a secondary character, as in the case with Frank Churchill, meditating upon its effects must have been something that was forefront in Jane Austen's mind. Another thing that we see is, again, this emphasis on the insularity of the family. This comes up obviously with Mr. Woodhouse who likes to stay at home, who likes to have his company come and visit him. But it comes up again now as we get to know Mr. John Knightley better. John Knightley is married to Isabella, Emma's older sister, and is the younger brother of Mr. Knightley. And so through this, we again see this sort of culture and they're both similar in this way. They see, we see this culture of sort of an insularity to the families. And this speaks to the conservative side of the argument. This speaks to the inbreeding side of like monarchy. You know, this idea that you want to consolidate power, consolidate wealth. A much commented upon moment in Emma is the scene in chapter 12, which marks the reconciliation between Emma and Mr. Knightley after they argue over whether or not Harriet should have accepted Mr. Robert Martin, whether Emma should have sort of inserted herself and worked her influence. The way that they get over the argument with each other is that Emma picks up one of her nieces, who's about eight months old, and she just creates for herself sort of a symbolic and visual representation of the Ma Madonna with a child. Now, this symbol represents the two highest ideals of femininity, that of motherhood and that of virginity. Now, of course, these things are impossible to actually 
complete in yet another impossible standard for women. No, but it's about their symbolic power. It's about what they represent symbolically, not what they represent logically. And so Emma being an aunt, picking up her niece, actually does unify this as far as we can in, in any kind of, I don't know, biological reality that any of us experience on the day to day. And in this conversation, we really see how a, another seed to the motivations for Emma to be overly involved in this matchmaking, to repress her own desires. It's not only the psychological fear of death being intertwined with the symbolic power of love, but it's also her relationship with Mr. Knightley. Because her father is such an incapable father, because he lacks such authority and power, because Emma is the one who's in charge in their relationship, Mr. Knightley has had to step in in the role of masculine power in her life, which puts him in a kind of avuncular role to her. So if she finds him attractive, which we suspect she does, as do I, Emma, then, you know, there's sort of a violation of boundaries that's very uncomfortable because she's always seen him prior to this, prior to her becoming, you know, 18 years old or however old she is in this book, she's really seen him as an older brother or maybe as an uncle figure, right? And so there is a really awkward transition there. He's not biologically her father, but he just symbolically fulfilled that role for her. And, and it's really just because her own father is lacking to that causes this void in the family structure that Mr. Knightley has been fulfilling and now it's like it's time for him to flip over into a new you know role with respect to her which is one of you know love interest of husband of sexual partner and that's really what this novel is about is figuring out how to awkwardly navigate that transition. In chapter 13, we get more language about Emma's blindness, especially regarding Mr. Elton. Here, Mr. John Knightley's advice is basically for her to open her eyes. He says like, pay attention, open your eyes, take a look at your surroundings. And she refuses in that moment. And in chapter 14, we see, you know, Emma for the first time being vexed. It's the first time, you know, from chapter one, she we had that famous opening line, she has had very little to vex her. But by chapter 14, Emma is vexed. Why? Because reality is encroaching in on her imaginary sort of world that she's created for herself, her imagined reality, like actual reality is forcing itself in. And it's very vexing, as I'm sure many of us have experienced. And we see her imagination sort of as Mr. Elton becomes more flirtatious and, and forcing himself as a, as a real possibility here for her romantically, we see that she immediately switches over to imagining what Frank Churchill must be like. And so she's rejecting Mr. Elton and going into yet a new fantasy, a deeper fantasy. So it's a bit of an inception thing, right? And the reason why she latches onto this idea of Frank Churchill is because obviously he's being talked about at this dinner party with the Weston family. They're hoping that he's gonna be able to come and visit. But the language that surrounds it as she meditates on Frank Churchill, there's two words that are really, really important. The first is that she considers him a name. It's just a name, Frank Churchill. Then she considers him an idea. It's just an idea never a person. She never considers him as a whole and complete person. And I think this idea of history, which we talked about with Harriet Smith, comes into this issue. She doesn't consider that Frank Churchill might have his own history, which in fact is the case before he comes to Highbury. He's already in love with somebody else. So that idea hasn't even really come into Emma's conception. And this idea of history also comes up with Mr. Elton later, but we'll get to that in a moment. As Emma is sort of imaginatively thinking about herself and Frank Churchill, she, a lot of times what she does is she de justifies the idea of this imaginary match by assuming and presuming that everybody else is thinking about the same match that she is. She thinks nothing could be more natural. And she does it with Harriet, even though nobody is thinking about that match except for her. And she does it now with herself with regards to Frank Churchill. In this case, she happens to be closer to reality because there's no doubt that Mr. and Mrs. Weston are also sort of 
harboring these same hopes for her and Frank. It's also more justifiable than what she did with Harriet because she's wagering her own heart. She's not wagering somebody else's and risking her own future and not risking somebody else's. And especially with regard to Harriet, it's quite cruel because Harriet's future is so much more insecure than Emma's. If Emma decides she doesn't want to risk her heart, she knows that she's perfectly safe. She has 30,000 pounds. She has the home. She has the family. She has the respectability. She has the financial security, whereas everything is insecure with Harriet. In chapter 15, we see that when Mr. Woodhouse is told about the snow that's coming down, he gets very worried about being able to make their way home in their carriage, and he immediately turns to Emma for advice and to sort of calm his worries. This again speaks to that role reversal between himself and his daughter, which has to do with then the power dynamic between Emma and Mr. Knightley, etc., etc. In chapter 16, we see that Emma has to really think about what she's done. She's now had the proposal from Mr. Elton. Most unpleasant experience for Emma. Jane Austen really can write like the most uncomfortable proposal scenes, and they even though you're just sitting there like cringing your heart out, it's so fun to read. Why is that? Why do we do this to ourselves? But again, here we see that Emma uses history as a prop for her sense of superiority with regard to Elton. And she's often using this language of whether somebody's a nobody or somebody's a somebody. And here we see Mr. Elton gets categorized as a nobody. And that's because he's only moved to Highbury two years ago. You know, he works in trade. He's a clergyman, so he has to work for his money. He obviously has the vicarage. And we also see language a lot surrounding, you know, the, the home, which we've talked about sort of the traditional power and representative force of the home with regard to Pride and Prejudice in my video that got posted a couple weeks ago now, where we talked about the role of Pemberley and how Elizabeth judges Darcy based on the reality that is Pemberley. And here we see the family home as representative, as iconic as well in this conception, as we consider sort of the Woodhouse's home, Hartfield, versus the vicarage that Elton had, lives in. And we see it, saw it the way that Emma described it and her response to it a few chapters earlier when she and Harriet were walking past. And in that chapter, she discussed the vicarage as being, you know, it doesn't have a nice approach. It's been very run down. Mr. Elton has been fixing it up. He's clearly been doing this to prepare for another woman to come into his house. And even though the approach is bad, it would be good enough for you Harriet, right? But it's definitely not good enough for Emma in Emma's own mind. And this also goes back to that same mercenary view of marriage, which is what do you give up for what you get? And even she accuses Elton of being mercenary. If he couldn't get Emma with her 30,000 pounds, then he would settle just fine for Miss Somebody with 20,000 pounds or some other Miss Somebody for 10,000 pounds. He would do his best to kind of make a good match for himself from a mercenary perspective. But part of Emma's snobbery is also mercenary. She she thinks about herself as the, being the woman of consequence that she is. So how much power would she give up to marry Mr. Elton versus being able to basically run the show at Hartfield? How much she has 30,000 pounds? How much independence would she have to give up? How much, uh, what home would she have to give up in, re in comparison to Hartfield to be able to sort of move in with her husband and that sort of thing? So like, she is also judging it from a mercenary perspective. Well. But at the same time, we do see that Emma holds herself responsible for behaving in such a way that could encourage Mr. Elton, if he weren't reading her mind, which he wasn't, about her intentions with uh, Harriet Smith, which apparently he had no idea about, right? And so we do see step by step a little bit of character growth for Emma. She does do this moment of reflection. She does do this moment where she holds herself accountable. She does say to herself, wow, Mr. Knightley and Mr. John Knightley really are perceptive. They really do notice things that I haven't noticed before. And even though we see that she's going to take another dive into yet another imaginary fantasy before she can really come to a point of greater maturity, we see the seeds that she's capable of this type of self-reflection. And I think that, you know, I get to in appreciate and enjoy the character of Emma more and more as the novel goes on, as she sort of has to deal with her own folly. And, you know, yeah, 
I'm enjoying this book definitely more this reading, and I'm enjoying the character of Emma more in this reading. But that's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of the puzzles and riddle games, what you think of the power dynamics between Emma and Mr. Knightley. Do you think that my sort of Freudian interpretation of sexual repression is correct here? I, I would love to hear what you're noticing in the novel. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.